Well, kia ora tato. Uh, great to see you all here this morning. I'm Brendan Burns, my colleague Dale Phillips. We're from Creative Development. Uh, wonderful to be here this morning in Greymouth. Uh, we uh, have been to a few NetHui. We're sponsors of NetHui, but great to see it back in a region. It was in Auckland last year, and while it was an OK session, this is where we think the focus needs to be. Um, we've got Ben, I think, here as our TUI team helper. Yeah, and he's got the pink box. And it was good to see at the end of that session with Patrick that um, people were picking up the microphone and, 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 and making this a, a live event. That's good to see. Um, so just a reminder of the co-parpa here. It's obviously very interactive and you're, you're all supposed to be tweeting and, and blogging and contributing. No, you're just, doing your, you're just doing your homework. Okay. Um, but um, So it's an open discussion that's designed to be collaborative and, and uh, we ought to share the session. We've only got an hour, so we're going to be trying to be relatively brief to just have a little scene setter for it. Um, we might need somebody running a microphone around. Is there anybody be prepared to help with that? Oh, you're going to do that, eh, Ben? Okay, cool. Okay, so we're our company, Creative, uh, we're engaged in supporting rural communities uh, to get better broad broadband. We're working uh, both here on the coast with Development West Coast, Knowledge Chris McKenzie, CEO this morning, uh, and Gary Howard, Maribola, um, and a number of other dignitaries from other councils I know. Uh, and I think Mayor Tony was here but had to leave. Um, so, uh, and we, I sort of want to also declare that we're, we're not from the West Coast, uh, but we are both mainlanders. Um, and uh, I live in Marlborough. Um, and I uh, am reliant in my business for the services that are provided to me by a local WISP, a wireless internet service provider. Dale. So I'm Dale Phillips. I am resident, well, resident in Christchurch. And my family is originally from the West Coast. My grandfather was a coal miner, went up, worked up and down the coast for many, many years. My mother was born on the coast. She went to school in Kamara. So it's sort of part of how we are. Uh, before I went to Christchurch, I lived in a place 30 minutes outside downtown Auckland. Um, in that particular community in Kaukopa Kopa, we had the kind of coverage you get in the most remote parts of here, read nothing. 30 minutes from downtown. A rural area, lifestyle blocks, that kind of thing. So it's not an uncommon problem. Um, if you're an urban resident, and that includes parts of Greymouth, Hokitika, Westport, you may be lucky enough to have reasonably good internet connections on fibre. If you're living further out, then you may well have wireless access through a wireless internet service provider and others. So the focus, most of the focus here and on the coast and nationally is on what a trio of mobile providers are doing nationally. That's a group known as the Rural Connectivity Group. And it is, they've been funded to deliver under the RBI2 work program. Is there anybody from RCG here today? No? Okay, thank you. So it's worth remembering and to set some context. We had the RBI1 program some years ago to deliver what was supposed to be, in working with the UFB program, 97% coverage to all of New Zealand. Most people would acknowledge that the RBI1 program sort of failed. We then had the RBI2 program, and the Rural Connectivity Group, which is a joint venture between Spark, Vodafone and Two Degrees, um, received circa $250 million of funding allocation from the Crown. Now, or well, 290 million, depending on who you talk to. And apart from that, a bunch of wireless internet service providers around New Zealand who are doing a fantastic job, and we have a couple of them here in the room, um, have received about $8 million in that initial funding round. Mm. Now, what it all means is that by the end of RBI2, the government will have spent nearly $600 million on supposedly fixing rural connectivity across New Zealand. But there's a problem. The conversations on the ground, the discussions in places like the West Coast, other parts of the country, Marlborough, Tasman, 
the far north, uh, Horizons region, Tararua district. There is a big difference between what is called coverage, claimed, versus reality. Left your mic up. Ah, apologies. So, right now, we've just done some analysis in the team based on published information, and that says that by the end of 2023 in the fibre rollouts, there will still be a minimum of 11,000 west coasters without any kind of fibre connectivity, which means that connectivity has to be provided by some other means. Okay, so um, part of the solution, a big part of the solution and a growing part of the solution here on the coast comes down to the uh, th three active WISPs that we're aware of. And I'd just like to acknowledge those. Mark here is from Zealand, based in Westport. They're doing a great job up in that part of the world and, and down into this part of the world. Uh, Brent Oldham and IT at work. I don't think Brent was able to be with us today, uh, but he's, he's active and was telling me, speaking just a day or two ago, uh, they're looking to putting uh, Wi-Fi connection through on the old coach road. That fabulous track that we've all got on our bucket list to go and walk or cycle. Uh, and also there's a, a third player, a more new uh, newcomer to the scene here, and that's um, our friends at Wi-Fi Connect, Ivan and uh, Leon, acknowledging them, who've been working with Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Smeaton from West Street, and doing a fantastic job over the last couple of years, connecting rural communities in particular um, through Wi-Fi. And Cheryl, I'd just like to now throw it open to you and Ivan. And uh, Leon, just tell us a little bit about what you've been able to achieve and do. So the pink box is coming your way. The pink box is coming? Yeah. Or well, you can have a microphone if you prefer. No, I'm happy with the pink box. Can you hear me on the pink box? I can't hear it. <laughs> um, hit it. <laughs> I've um, put a few slides together, mainly because I've got this really talent, this real talent, to go right off track. So um, I figure if I've got slides, I won't. Start talking to it anyway. And, and Start the, te the tech will always follow, as we know. Mm. <laughs> um, so my name's Cheryl Smeaton. I work at West Reap. Um, I'm the adult community education team leader there. And I've been there since 2004. In 2004, when I started there, um, oh, West Street, we deliver education in rural communities where there are gaps or barriers to accessibility. Um, so in 2004, when I started there, um, we Street had just started a partnership with the 2020 Computers and Homes. That was what the organisation was called at the time. And the co-couple was delivering um, computer education, basic computer digital literacy, to 20 families in 20 weeks, with 20, delivering 20 computers and 20 internet connections into homes. Um, every New Zealander, the, the, the every New Zealand home should have access to the internet and a computer. That's how this organisation was started. So that met West Reap's um, delivering education in rural communities where there are gaps. It, we fitted well as a partnership. So that's how we got into it. <laughs> the tech follows. So West Street delivered over 1,000 um, computers in homes. Um, I think it's closer to 1,500. In the 13 years coastwide that we operated computers in homes, we stopped doing that last year. In the meantime, um, the computers in homes um, program morphed into, thank you, the 2020 Communications, uh, Communications Trust and then the 2020 Trust. Um, there were four regions at the beginning, uh, of which the West Coast was one. And in that time, um, and I think Leon's as well was one, um, about th it grew to about 30 groups and community organisations. I've thrown Dora up there because she's my baby. And um, we do have her on the West Coast. She's another 2020 Computers and Homes, or 2020 Trust project. Um, what happened during the time that we um, we're working together and growing together and learning and coming up with solutions for communities, going back to that co-papa of every New Zealand household, was um, I got to know Ivan and Leon quite well. And um, in the community where they live on the east coast of the North Island, the demographic and the geography is very similar to the west coast of the South Island. We know, for example, that our two MPs often work closely together because the um, issues are similar. So um, in the east coast, the east coast of the north met the west coast of the south. 
and I was watching while these guys were, um, I guess, I guess, discovering these solutions and coming along to our um, our regular hui and talking about the kinds of things they were doing in their communities, and all the time thinking, if they can do it there, we could probably do it here. How do we get them down here? So it was about trying to um, uh, trying to get that happening. I've got my clicker. I can click. Woohoo! Um, so fast forward to 2015, the New Zealand, um, the government began to invest in ultra-fast broadband projects a little before then. Um, connections to schools were prioritised so that by 2016, 97.7% of the country, uh, the schools would have access to a fibre cable and the idea of that was that schools could become community hotspots for, uh, or, or hubs for their community. We were approached at West Street by Westland High School, um, Trevor Jones, the principal there at the time, and Fox Glacier School, Casper um, Kruger, who was there at the time, saying that they had been talking about that in their communities and they knew it was possible, but they didn't know how. And they wondered if anybody at 2020 Trust did. And I did. So um, I contacted them and said, how can we get you guys down here? How can we um, work together? So. Um, in those, using those, thinking of those two schools, the areas that we focused on were Fox to Bruce Bay, which was an issue, um, and also in Westland it was the Arahura and Awatuna communities. Um, neither of those were able to um, get access to the internet. And the other common denominator there were the two marae. So Ivan and Leon, that's probably the view I had most of them during that first trip in 2015, was driving up and down the length of the coast and then parking while they got out and did that. Um, looking for high sites and looking for, looking for um, open spaces. So we had the first of our planning days in September 2015 at the um, Bruce Bay Marae, um, where the community came together and talked about what the needs might be and how we could, um, and, and what sort of solutions they could come up with. And the guys, of course, they had their ideas, but the community knew their place better, so um, it was a match made in heaven. So we worked in Bruce Bay over that period of time, um, and I've sort of that, that's that's a, a couple of um, references that are in the thing. We won't read those. Um, we know how, where they are. Um, but the work was completed in early March in 2017, and there were time delays because we have weather. Um, and often these guys would come down and spend two weeks and sit and watch the rain. Um, but what they were doing was focusing that time in training local people in how to do what they do and in talking with them and, and again, coming up with those um, solutions to whatever problems came up, including weather. And what they built on the ground was quite a good um, collection of people who, who know the work and know the um, stuff. So in March 2017, we launched there is um, the pole on Karangarua Ridge. So um, it's, it's quite cool. There's the so view. How, so how many people now are in Bruce Bay and north from there are now connected? <coughs> Ivan? Yeah, probably around um, between Fox and Bruce, we've probably got about 50, 60. Mm -hmm. yeah, and around oh, sorry, we should have microphoned you. Sorry, just a little reminder. Make sure we speak into a mic because no one who's watching can hear us. My grandkids would love this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, we've, I suppose, what, about 50 or 60 around Bruce Bay and up to Fox. And um, when we went down there initially, oh, we partnered with Nati McCarfield because uh, they seen an opportunity for a lot of tourism out of there, but they didn't have connection. Yeah. And... Um, it was sort of built from the ground there. We've got we've got the number in Bruce Bay. Everybody was like, oh, we're going to save so much money now. We've got a satellite and it's costing us this, this mm. and this. So everybody jumped on board down there basically, okay. which was good. And the total number across all of the projects that you've done now connected? In Hukatika, probably around uh, 60, 70. Okay. And we've got a few networks in the in North Island. Fantastic. Great. Well... I think that's just an example of coordination, community involvement, working together with a small company that's and del delivering. That's our coverage from um, Fox to Bruce yeah. and then um, from Mount French out through Hukatika. And are those real blast maps? 
not, yeah. not, not yes. the ones that we see that claim coverage basically <laughs> all, all over the case for cell phone coverage. And <coughs> no, those are real. Those are real. Okay. Yeah, those <laughs> are theirs. That's the next part of That's the project. The but yeah. it's at that la launch in March um, 2017 where West Reap, West Reap's involvement's no longer necessary. Right. We've met our gap and we've stepped out of it and now the guys are working with those communities to um, continue the development. Yeah. And that's how it will go. So that takes us into a domain which is called coverage. Or we could also call it the myth of coverage. So you'll see these wonderful maps are produced and they show you that when you drive along the west coast you have great coverage everywhere. Any, anybody want to comment? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we understand. Merton, There's lots of laughter. Merton, laughter in the audience. So, for, for context, we've driven up and down the coast four times. There is a difference between coverage claimed off a map, which is based upon a thing called predictive radio modelling. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're not going to get into too much technical detail, but <laughs> sorry. All right. It's made up. Yeah. <laughs> it's what it comes down to. Yeah. That's not the same as usable coverage where your cell phone works constantly and you can use it, for example, to provide yourself with a high-speed internet connection. Different things. So with the coast, what does the coast need and want? The government is saying 99% coverage of the population is the desired target and it should not matter where you live at all. So what are your views? What's okay. reality for you? Right. Okay, lady over here, I think that might be Cynthia from Blackpool, formerly Hilton. Yep, I'm from Blackpool. Um, our coverage drops in and out all the time. You can't actually even stay. We've got an antenna at the end of the road. Last uh, Yesterday I had Spark come out and talk to me about it and they said, we've got a new antenna. I said, could you please put the old one back because the connectivity is worse than it was last week. <laughs> we've got on one of our Facebook pages a everybody complaining about cell phone coverage dropping in and out, and that's in town, in our town. And we had coverage that was fine last week, and this week it's not there at all. And as far as the internet's concerned, it just drops in and out all the time. I reboot my computer to run my business up to six times, sometimes 12 times a day, just to get email. So connectivity is not there. So the impact on your business is awful. It's huge, I get yeah. people ringing me up and actually saying, I've sent you an email and I haven't got it. Okay. So All it's right. not pinging back to them as undelivered, so they assume it's delivered, but yeah. I'm not getting them. All right. Gentleman here wants to contribute? Throw him the pink box. Yeah, I um, try to get, uh, I'm an accountant in town, I'm 200 by 200 fiber, and I try and communicate with, uh, say, Cynthia, and try and get her on the two factor authentication. Uh, and clear a Google cache and uh, get onto the cloud and about uh, 15 minutes later we give up and uh, I start sending stuff in the mail again. Uh, but I need to connect with these clients and driving up and down the west coast mm. I need to be able to connect with them. What I notice is during the tourism season the tourists are using the nodes a lot more on the cell phone towers and the internet speed just drops completely out, so you can't get internet co connectivity during the tourism season, uh, say entering into Fox Glacier or Franz Josef where you hit the 3G towers. Uh, so the nodes aren't there. The, the backbone just ain't there uh, with Celia. All right. So we know that the RCG is, is going to be putting in, I think, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, is it 24 towers? Mark, you might know that figure. 24 towers down the coast? Do you, want to, do you want to comment about what gaps you see will still be there? Because this is the government's big spend. Mark and his company are getting some funding, uh, potentially through, through programs, to expand what they're doing. This is ZLAN. But what are the gaps going to be left, Mark, do you think? There's still some small gaps in rural communities. We're still trying to help out a com community in Nelson Creek that are still missing out. <laughs> Chorus believes there's adequate speed there and we can't seem to get past that hurdle. But it's, there's a lot more small places we're uh, still going to miss out. Yep. And a gentleman over here. Good catch. 
I'm Alan Wilson from Emergency Management Consulting. I'm also the Civil Defence Group Controller for the West Coast. Um, our great concern is lack of coverage because in a disaster, we don't know where people are if they can't talk to us. Mm. So, you know, between Makarok and Haast, for example, as we know, there's no coverage. The other thing that worries me greatly is the resilience of the cellular network. Um, all we need, as we know, is one break in the fibre optic, and we've got great problems, and that doesn't seem to be being addressed at all. Yeah, now that's a very valid question, and I can speak from some knowledge about, I lived in Christchurch through the earthquakes, and then on the edges of the Kaikoura earthquake, we had just about everything drop out, Kaikoura, and it was only the local WISP that kept going, kept that town connected for about three days. Is there, I was just thinking about your cyclonic events, the two back in February, which left great swathes of the coast without connectivity. And I know it had a particular impact on Westland Milk. Is, is there anybody here from Westland Milk? Can, I just, can I just jump in there, actually? So I live down in Hokitika, and during the cyclones, we did lose power, I think, with the first one. And as part of that, it was assumed that we could get civil defence information via the internet when obviously we lost power and internet because of that and we couldn't get that information and it wasn't available as we needed over the radio. So that was a biggie and Hokitika is quite a big place. So I don't know how the, the smaller communities coped when they couldn't get that information. Even just to do with water treatment, etc., was a biggie. Yeah. Well, the biggest stress, of course, is not being able to contact. And uh, go on, Mark. Um, you said you couldn't get anything on the radio. I know that Coast FM was broadcasting all the messages for civil defence for Western Dairy as well as the councils. And we had generators going on top of hilltops to keep the systems going. Oh. So we could get radio, um, but <laughs> it's going to sound stupid. I'm a young person and I use the internet. So I wasn't sure which radio station even to check. I was scanning through them and found some radio stations, but actually initially the information that they had wasn't the, that was very basic. It just said, you know, hang in there. <laughs> um, and it didn't have information today, for example, you know, your, your water's okay to drink or it needs treating, um, which as a mum with two young kids was quite important. So, um, yeah, just because you have radio doesn't actually mean, sorry, that people aren't used to using the internet and actually need need a bit more help. Um, so, yeah, that, that um, and you can get a lot more information more easily by the internet than radio. Obviously, yeah. internet's a bit more two-way communication. Radio is very one-way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So, is anyone here familiar or understand the terms resilient and resilience in the context of communications or broadband delivery? Who actually understands it? Okay. So, probably pay to explain slightly. Resilience in that context means that what you are hooked up to, be it broadband or telecommunications, keeps working come what, what may. If something breaks, something else keeps working. Well, pretty simple principle, right? In the Kaikoura earthquakes, everything fell over. The sites fell over. The backup generators didn't work. The fibre connectivity fell over. The whole lot, it went down the toilet. The only people who kept going was wasps, as Brendan mentioned. So on a coast like this, where you're long and you're remote and you're rural, that resilience becomes very, very important, particularly in adversity. Now, curiously, when you talk to the officials, resilience as a proposition has been dodged. It's an elephant in the room for New Zealand. It's not being built into, into the contracts. And it's not built into the contracts, as far as we're aware, for RBI2 either. Why? There are claims that it is a lot more expensive to do it. Actually, it's not true. Well, let's just test, that's let's just test that. With so the, test it. So anyone here from the carriers stuff? or anyone who can comment? Did you keep going through the two cyclones? Right. Right. Ivan? Ivan? Yeah, we had an issue with the edge coming up. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. We need the microphones. Oh. Yep. I just need to say that later on in the program this afternoon there is another session on resilience yep, well, sure. um, and so some of that topic might be Thanks. better covered then, not right. that I'm saying 
No, no, we'll just... Votes, but, yeah, we'll let Ivan make his good, comment and we'll move on from that. Thanks, Alan. It's worthwhile intervention. Forget about this, yeah. In, in the um, Edgecombe floods that also um, affected the Uruwetas, we've got a network in a tiny little place called um, Minganui. Um, all the roads were cut off. They didn't have cell coverage. They didn't have power. The only way civil defence could get to the people in the village with about 100, 150 houses was our network was still going. Okay. So we'll see. Yep. Yeah, just in the interest of balance, uh, uh, Spark was able to put the satellite transmitters into Kaikoura within that week, yeah. within that period, and get uh, cell phone coverage up uh, and running. So, My understanding is that with cellular technology, the sites expand and contract as congestion occurs. Doesn't that mean that, as the lady said before, with regard to places like Blackball, that if you don't have an adjacent cell site, you lose connectivity due, due, to, local connect, uh, due to local congestion? Christchurch. Um, the cell network stood up in Christchurch. Um, and had the cell network not stood up in Christchurch, it would have been a hell of a lot worse. And as the networks, as you say, started to, to shrink, okay, the various companies brought in cows, cells on wheels, and they set up new cell towers all over the place, and that allowed c capability. And so, so uh, cell actually saved Christchurch a yep. huge right. amount of stress. It, it, it did work quite well. I'm going to move on from that because I think we've noted there's a further workshop on resilience. Now, Gary from Buller, you run a council. Uh, you've got a big uh, interest in that community. Do you want to just talk about what challenges the current lack of co connectivity is presented for Buller or the wider coast, that's fine, and what solutions you're starting to see. Okay. We've got challenges of competing Vodafone, uh, Spark, and places like Punakaiki. Uh, Punakaiki has got pretty poor coverage of cell phone, um, depending on which uh, phone company you're with. We've got a number of uh, smaller communities when we take the likes of Semble, which is Upper Valley, uh, Little Wanganui, um, Karamea has actually been uh, fixed, but we have got small pockets of populations in numerous areas, and we go right through to Maruia, um, so you know it's a fair coverage in the Bula district. Uh, even places just out from Mai Mai and Ingamatua uh, that are really still struggling about capacity, they may have broadband, but sending an email with an attachment of greater than two megabytes is uh, really just a, a big challenge for them. So th in some places, it's not the fact that they haven't got coverage, it's actually the capacity of being able to uh, send and receive in today where photographs and uh, documents can be four to 10 megabytes quite easily. So we've got large areas that still need uh, solutions and uh, communities that, for survival really, uh, this is as much as like electricity and water, internet is a key service now. Yeah. All right, lady over here. <laughs> so at the moment, who, if, you've, if you're a household or a community on the west coast and you're having trouble accessing the internet for what you need to do, who or where is the best touch point to contact and say, we need help? Does well. anyone know? That is. Yeah, go. Yeah. Sorry, from a from a day to day point of view, rather than emergency, but emergency is useful too. Okay, that's a, that is actually probably one of the elephant in the room questions. So, you've got Chorus providing services, fibre to places. They sell that through Spark, Vodafone, Two Degrees, and others, power companies. You have Spark. Vodafone in two degrees, in their own right, selling you services, um, typically based on a mobile phone. You might have seen some marketing shifts in recent times saying that Vodafone and Spark in two degrees sell wireless coverage. Um, it's actually mobile coverage, but using a wireless type device, but it's mobile. And then you come into the issue of coverage. Oh, right? don't, don't forget the WISPs too. And the WISPs, who provide services in a lot of hard to reach places. You come to what's called coverage, and you come to what is called, or better known as, it's not commercial. 
So, what does commercial mean in this context? WISPs around New Zealand provide great services and lots of hard to reach places. They are businesses, they're profitable, they're doing good business, they're providing needed services. So clearly it is commercial. So what are we talking about when we mean commercial? So to answer your question, that's the issue. Wisp Wireless what? internet service provider. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do, do stick your hand up if the acronyms lose you. Um, yeah, it matters. So this is the up. issue. Coverage and what is commercial or not. Um, coming back to the comments that uh, Cynthia made about blackball. Blackball is a really interesting situation because supposedly they were fibred by Chorus to a cabinet as a part of the RBI1 program. And that cabinet then provides a fibre service to the local school. Supposedly, according to the coverage maps, um, they have great VDSL services, uh, copper-based high bandwidth broadband. But when you look at the cabinet that sits in the town, it's probably 35 years old. <laughs> it doesn't provide the services that are claimed. And no one can seem to answer the question as to why or why not. Um, is there anyone from Chorus in the room who could comment? Just a question, because I know someone's supposed to be no. in there too. Oh, okay. So there we have an issue. <laughs> That's an exact example. We might get a tweet. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, yes, take that. So is there anyone from the regional council here? Who hey. uh, Does the regional council <laughs> have a role in ensuring... That, uh, that the local communities do have what they need as far as internet's concerned? Not a right, so, so is it worth the West Coast developing some sort of organisation to make sure that people have the access that they need, whether it be enforcing contracts and, and systems that should be already working or working with WISPs to make sure that communities have the internet? Is it worth I suppose I'm asking the question, is it worth us on the West Coast having a certain entity that's in charge of making sure that happens, given how important the West the internet is to our community? Well, I think that is recognised, and if you read the fairly recently published Regional Economic Development Plan, inherent in that is that the coast from end to end should have, must have coverage, because um, under the various categories of economic growth drivers, be it farming, be it tourism, all of those need the connectivity. And that's the, the work that we've been doing with Development West Coast, is to look at the big picture, see where the gaps still remain, and look at the solutions. And it means working with all of the parties, the big guys, the small guys, the communities, and finding some solutions through those once the picture becomes clear. So that work is in train. Right. Development West Coast, yeah. Development West Coast yes. Ma'am. OK, so um, there's probably a lot of communities that have got these um, cabinets that aren't up to spec. How are we going to get them up to spec? Well, this is where things get a little bit interesting. Supposedly, when RBI1 rolled, RBI rolled out the fibre to schools, all of those cabinets were supposed to have been upgraded to current technology, current specification i.e. we can sit at a computer sitting in our network centre and we go doodly 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 and that 100 megabit link is suddenly a gigabit link or a 4 gig link or something else. But that's not what happened in the real world. What happened in the real world is cabinets got upgraded and then the bandwidth supply was limited, arguably artificially, so additional charges could be levied for cabinet upgrades. A perfect example, that remote community I lived in, rural school. Fantastic fibre to the school. New cabinet. The cabinet could deliver um, four, five, six, ten gigabit capability, but it had been artificially limited. So when the local community wanted an upgrade to decent broadband coverage, they were, about, Chorus was saying to them at the time, oh, it's going to cost you $38,000 to upgrade the cabinet. Community said, hang on a minute, wasn't this supposed to have been upgraded? And things went very quiet. Yeah. These, and these stories are legend. All They're over, all over the all country. All over the coast, all over the country. And the first thing you need to do is actually do a proper audit and survey and find out what is the infrastructure. Is it actually at the spec that it's supposed to have been installed at? Where are the gaps? 
and how do you fill those gaps? Right, back to Cynthia. The problem that we actually have in Blackpool is that we've got a great walk opening next year and we're going to have first year estimates say 6,000 people coming through our wee town mm -hmm. and they're all going to want to be connected and they'll probably want to get that connectivity to continue up to the huts on this great walk. So we've only got 12 months to sort this out right. and then the tourists are coming and the, the projections are that on the Paparoa track there are going to be 6,000 the first year and it will increase by at least 20% each year after that and once the Pike 29 track opens then that will also increase the number of visitors. So it's, it's vitally important that Blackpool sorts out its connectivity problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, in fact, council, is it Grey Council or somebody has stumped up a considerable sum of, sum of money to help you get started at least with that in the Blackpool land track area. So that's through DWC or Grey, Grey District or? Through the Tourism Fund. Through the Tourism Fund. Good on. Good on them. Well, that's at least that'll that'll provide the start to that work. Okay. It's probably worth sort of mentioning now that the Wisps, like us, are actually waiting for the um, <coughs> Crown infrastructure to um, decide the next part of the RBI2 expansion, and so they we stuck in the bid like about 20 months ago, and uh, they tell us that it should be announced this month. So um, after we get told who the successful bidders are and where the connectivity is, then we can go ahead you know, and hit a lot of these small places like Blackpools and the, the all over the place. So uh, we're waiting on government at the moment. So hopefully we're only talking a few weeks. Um, but yeah, so it's you know, actually right. worth sort of noticing that the, the RBI2 is mm -hmm. happening. New, qu oh, new question up the back, ma'am, if we could. That lady's had a hand up. And we'll wait for the pink box to arrive. Hi, I'm Cindy Hopper. Hold it right up to you towards good. your mouth, please. All good. Hi, I'm Cindy Hopper from West Coast Scenic Waterways, owner-operator up there. And uh, we have real serious connection problems where we are because our clients operate up the Mahanapur Creek and will be through the Mahanapur section of the West Coast Wilderness Trail. And uh, we have no connection with them when they're on the waterway or other than sending a personal locator beacon mm. and giving them a safety map where there are areas they can find connection. But it is pretty risky and that's why we refuse to let them go without personal locator beacons. And even in accommodation, we're restricted by rural broadband to 120 gigabytes for all our clients and that's about to expand. So, yeah, connection, and we're only four kilometres south of Hokitaka, right. is pretty serious for us. So, yeah. Um, yeah, if that could be addressed, that would be awesome. Good. Yep. Thank you. Back to that. Ma'am. The other thing I'd like to, um, to add to the conversation is we've got fibre in Hokitaka now and some other areas on the coast, and I think it's important that actually are people still able to access that connection through the rollout? Um, so I think it's important to make sure that everyone that can access that, that does, um, purely for pr future proofing, just because you may not be using the fibre currently in the house that you're in. If you're renting, the next renter may want to access that, or um, if somebody's selling a house, it may affect the resale value because in time, connecting fibre to that house may cost a lot of money. So actually f making sure, actually, if Development West Coast could look at promoting that a little more yeah. and making sure that, that people who can access the fibre do, even if they don't use it right now, that's going to be really important. I think that's a very good point. And of course, you know, the government is funding the chorus, mostly, uh, one or two other providers in other parts of the country. Um, and chorus, of course, I should acknowledge, is working with local providers here. It's working with Westpower, uh, Electronet, uh, to do the rollout, so it shows there are capable companies here on the coast that can do this kind of work. And at the moment, it is absolutely free to connect your home to fibre. There are a few issues, as you may have seen in the media this week, about Chorus and, and some of its employment practices that are concerning. Uh, and I, but I don't think that would apply here on the west coast. Certainly, no. Roger from West uh, from West Power is shaking his head. So we know that their their staff are looked after, and that's a great thing to see. But you know, it's free, you'd be almost silly not to get in, and yet nationally the uptake of fibre running past the door is still well below 
So you're right, it, it does add value to your home and it certainly, um, certainly enables your household. I just wanted to add that it's, it's been a bit different here on the coast. I know in Christchurch you had to organise that through a provider and get connected immediately, but actually here on the coast that doesn't seem to be the way it's happening. So you can connect and then wait All right. to change the fibre. Well, let's, let's ask Roger a question about that and how, how's the rollout going here? on the coast because you guys are the principal provider of rollout for fibre on the west coast? Yes, we started in Greymouth, must be at four or five years ago now, and it was done a bit differently here because we did it on the overhead uh, power line. So we, we um, worked with Chorus in developing that, that's been used around the country now. But at Hokitika we tried something new. When we did the rollout we also had people going and knocking on doors and saying, hey, when we, we run our fibre in the area, would you like to connect? And so that meant our, our crews could go out, they have, have all the jobs sort of lined up in front of them, and we got a huge uptake in Hokitika. Even though they didn't necessarily have the ISPs on board, that's the people that provide you the, you know. Yeah, a and it scared chorus for a start, I think, because we had so much uptake, you know. But it was good, because it really, it really gets that connectivity up. But yeah, I can't impress on everyone enough. If you get the chance, to do it. It's free, it costs you nothing. Yeah. In two or three years' time, that, that opportunity may, may evaporate. Yeah. Hang on, ma'am. You can't ask, ask the question without the box. And can we just, perhaps if there's another question, we might just move on from the fibre sure. question. But. Just to compare, do you know how much it would cost a household to connect on average if they don't take yeah. advantage of this plan? Do you have an idea? I think it's of the order of about $3,000. Yes. Yeah. So the question was, yeah, if you didn't get it free and you had to pay in three years' time, I think of the order of, the correct, Dale? About uh, 1500 to the... Standard. The right. standard fibre drop cost is about $1,100, which is what Chorus gets for it, yeah. or be. the provider. Um, it varies yeah. depending Tricky on who you talk to. Be. So a stand, that's a standard installation. Right. So $1,000 plus. All right, was there a question up the back? Well, I've just got a couple of things that sorry, I could... Sorry, where you go, please. Thanks very much, finally. Hey, um, Richard Holstein from Digital Journey, um, over for the day, enjoying it thus far from Christchurch. I just wanted to add a couple of things, I guess, into the discussion, I guess, to throw in there. I was involved in leading a relatively small project uh, down with the Central Otago District Council about a year, 18 months ago now, um, with a little bit of funding from uh, the DIA. I understand we're in the room today as well. Um, we were looking, at, so the Tibet Valley, so a mix of residents, uh, businesses, and other people were very concerned. They knew that what the rollout timetable was through until about 2023. This is Tibet Valley, for those of you who don't know, is an area between, I guess, it comprises about four or five small towns, rural towns, a lot of horticultural businesses, very big exporters down there, as well as small businesses and residents and what have you in central Otago, just sort of um, south of Alexandra, basically. And um, we looked at a whole range of options, and the WISPs were great as well. Talked to a range of WISPs down there, who were, some of whom were um, operating, some of whom weren't. Um, but a couple of solutions that came up in that regard, and I realised the geography is somewhat different and it's not as long. The Tebet Valley by no means stretches the length you know, uh, of the coast. Uh, but there were some really viable options that we uh, came up with Again, there was some cost involved. Uh, that included communities building their own fibre networks in ground and overhead lines, which has happened overseas. Um, of course, people, admittedly, a little bit easier in Teviot Valley with the topography, I suspect, in the farmland between areas. But that was absolutely viable in terms of actually creating a community-owned asset. That, yes, there was some... Uh, there was definitely some, and it was very you know, high level kind of costings we did and what have you, but that was certainly an option uh, that we presented down there, and one would have thought might be worth looking at down here. Um, but as I say, there were certainly, I could pass on, there were certainly a range of, and you guys I'm sure would know, there are a range of um, areas overseas that have had the same sorts of issues where, rightly or wrongly, you can argue about government and RBI 1 and RBI 2 and cables and, sorry, um, you know, cabinets and should they be upgraded and where's the money gone and all that sort of stuff, but fundamentally, if you want to get on, there are, certainly community-led options available to people yep. um, that could be taken up. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, that are Richard. doable. Lady up the back with laptop in hand. Yeah. Hi, we have um, Ed Strafford on the live stream. Um, he said, we are in Lightning Lab GovTech. We are building a tool to help communities tell funders and potential partners their digital inclusion needs. Uh, they have a chorus guy in their team, and he said, do you want to chat? So I guess if anyone wants to chat to um, Ed Strafford, uh, sorry, Strafford. Um, yeah, we Pick can put you in touch with him. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Actually, sorry, if you just allow me one you other said thing. said two it's, issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, I was forgotten while I was burbling on. Um, the, second, uh, the second potential solution, um, and I think it's kind of been touched on a little bit, I think, here, and again, it was a while ago in my head, um, I think it was TrustPower, the lines company uh, that ran, because it was down to me when I first got involved in the project, how much fibre there is already under the ground everywhere, pretty much. You just can't get to it. <laughs> you can't connect. Um, but the lines companies often also have, I think from a civil defence point of view, and they have fail safes and what have you with fibre between various um, installations, but they were generally, in my discussions with them some time back, always very open to community projects and you know, seeing if they could make it possible when they built their, upgraded their fibre networks, so that they could connect into communities and towns. We're very open to those sorts of things. That was always the impression I got anyway. Yep, certainly the lines companies in general, I think, have a big role to play. Uh, Vanessa's just signalled that we have 10 minutes to go, so uh, let's see if there's any new voices that we haven't heard from. This gentleman here. Yeah, um, mine's, my question or my comment is uh, sort of looping back to the uh, previous pre presentation on IoT. Um, we've heard from uh, Spark guys that uh, the uh, major telcos are probably unlikely to, to roll out a full network across the coast. Um, can we have some comment from the WISPs uh, as to what their IoT capabilities might be? All right, well the microphone's very close to Ivan and Leon, but they're throwing it across to Mark. There we are, good cooperation amongst the WISPs, we like to see that. Hi. Um, we are rolling out a Laura LAN across our network at the moment. We're working with a company in Westport, uh, Vertigo who is developing the product and trying to get it out across the West Coast. And we're putting the repeaters on all our repeater sites, so we've got reasonable coverage from Karamea Gun down to Haast. Right. Are they specific sites for IoT? Or? They're on existing repeater sites. OK, so yep. it's an add-on service. An add -on service. service yep. Yeah, that, that, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Rather, this is one of the things that I think I'd like to just dwell on towards the end, and that is there is a lot of infrastructure there. There's some infrastructure coming through RBI too, but it's making sure that, that, that all that infrastructure is used. I mean, we've got 800 kilometres uh, uh, of length, uh, 33,000 people to service. The last thing I think anyone, any government would want to see is, is building over the top of existing infrastructure, be it a WISP be it a, uh, a, an RBI facility, be it Chorus Fibre. And w w one of the things that has not yet emerged is any kind of sense of cooperation, you know, community interest put first rather than some of the commercial ethics. And I think that's one of the things we really want to see emerge. And it's so important in, in rural communities. In towns, there's enough, there's enough people competing for their services to make it viable to have a tower here and a tower there, and they're both competing against each other. But that isn't the case when you've got, you know, the community of a small provincial city stretched, you know, from Karamea to Haast. So, um, anyway, final comments coming now. And, oh, and uh, one of our younger contributors. Um, um, I'm just trying to say, um, what will the connections do for the West Coast and how will they help the West Coast connections? I think I'll ask Dale to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there is a thing called digital inclusion. There is a thing called digital enablement, which everyone is saying is very important. And it is extremely important. The issue that exists is until you have the physical infrastructure to provide a service, you can't provide for digital inclusion and digital enablement. For you guys, I assume you're all at, pr you're at primary school? Uh, yeah. yeah, and you use Google Apps for education? And you have your own computers? Um, no, in my school we don't. Yeah. Um, we don't. We, we uh, in our school, Westport North School, we have a computer room, or we usually use uh, one. We are, our teacher has two computers, so we have got iPads and like that. But there's not very much of them. So there's like room six is our computer room, which we go down and go and see our internet. Um, however, in my school, um, in each class, they've got about 10 computer iPad things, I think, and yeah, and we use Google frequently just to, the teacher says, could you please find out what this is, and <laughs> so, no, okay. yeah. 
That's what we so do. how do you guys do your homework at home if you haven't got the internet and you haven't got a computer? Well, um, what we do is when I get home, I usually, um, mum usually comes in here and she says, let's go and do some maths questions. So what she does is she goes um, and gets some paper from the printer and then, then, we, then she starts trying the questions down. Okay. So do you guys have your own computers? Uh, yeah, I do. I yeah. have an Acer um, Alplane. Yeah. So, and you? I just have an iPad and a phone. Okay. Cool. So to answer your question, if you have decent coverage where you live, you can do your homework on Google Apps for Education on your computer at home. Yeah. That's what it means to you, among other things, other than playing games and checking out the web and all that cool stuff. Okay. But sadly, there are many children around the West Coast who, when they want to do their homework when they get home, they can't because mum and dad haven't got the connection that allows them to go online and you know do their homework. And as you know, now it's a requirement. You go home with your homework and you're, you're required to go online and do stuff at home. So for those kids, they either can't do their homework or mum and dad have to spend a lot of money on satellite services to give them broadband. And we know of families that are spending $500 a month plus mostly just to allow their children connectivity. And that's just outrageous in this day and age, in my view. Anyway, I'm the lady up the back here. Oh, somebody else? Where are you going? Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, so just timely reflecting on digital inclusion. I'm from the Department of Internal Affairs and we've got a small team working on digital inclusion. So, I mean, it's great for me to um, hear everyone's stories and we're looking, obviously, at, at getting the data behind it. It was really interesting to hear you saying this is what these maps say about connectivity and connection, and this is what the reality is. So I think that's a really important story to tell as well, what, um, what people are experiencing versus what's being said. Um, so we are, you know, creating an action plan, uh, looking at, you know, what's what's happening, and because there's actually lots of good work happening, but we don't really know, and where's, where's, where can we focus to make the best impact? So um, please feel free to, you know, hit me up, talk to me, share your stories. Um, that would be great. Thanks very much. Okay. I want that lady here. Hi, I'm Miriam, and I'm actually from Bola High School. So I'd have to first of all say that um, the connection at our school is really, really good. Um, and we're really grateful that the government has actually given us um, nice fibre. Um, but our real big problem is that if we look at our students, and you know these kids have actually come up with part of this, is that 20% of our students do not have um, access to the internet at home. So it's very difficult then to actually set them project work that actually involves the internet at home. Uh, we have actually come up with a couple of things like homework clubs and all that sort of thing in local communities, but then these kids actually have to then turn around and actually travel, you know, another 20, 30 k's back to home. Mm. And, you know, when some of our kids are actually starting at 7 o'clock in the morning to get on a bus to come to school, it's a little bit ridiculous. Okay. Um, you know, we've, we're getting told, you know, 2020, NCA is all supposed to be digital. Um, if our kids don't have a computer at home to practice, then they're not going to be able to efficiently sit those exams. Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, the connectivity is actually a really, probably a huge thing for us. We can't do things like flip classrooms because the kids can't actually access at home um, all that material. So you actually are trying to do two lessons in, in one, really, for our kids, yeah. Thank but you. I am actually grateful for what we've actually got at our school. Yeah, yeah, I think we all should acknowledge, you know, there's been a big spend and a lot of people have benefited. I think the point of this forum is that there are still gaps and, and very likely considerable gaps still post the spend that's currently been provisioned. I actually think it's about these guys, I want to thank you both for coming today, because it's, it's about what we can do to ensure you have the sort of future that you deserve to have living here on the West Coast. Uh, and you are already showing how much and how important it is to have that connectivity both at school and at home. It's about the future. Uh, and I think we've had a good session today. It's been collaborative and as far as I'm concerned, that's what it's about. We need everybody in the room 
in the region, in the country, to actually be able to work together, use what infrastructure we've got, see the gaps, and work collaboratively to fill those gaps so these guys and everybody else can have the sort of digital future they deserve. So with that thought, Vanessa, are we now out of time? So thanks, everybody, for contributing. And let's hope we continue the discussion through the rest of the day. Thank you.